All right, so, so just just back to where we're at, this commission. John sandwiches it, bet- or Mark sandwiches it between this, the, the story of, of John's death in between the sending out of the 12. And he does that to show us the kind of trust, the kind of risks that are involved in taking the gospel out. But that commission, very different than the commission that we're sent out to do. But let's read this story and see what happens with John. In in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 14, it says, King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he's Elijah. And still others claimed he's a prophet, like one of the prophets long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been, risen, has been raised from the dead. Like These are things that people are starting to, to talk about Jesus. Do you notice that the disciples' ministry has been effective? Look at verse 14. Jesus' name had become well known. How did it become well known? Because just earlier in this chapter... Jesus took his 12 disciples and split them up two by two. And those 12 disciples went into six different towns and began to teach the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe. But it wasn't a message about themselves. It was a message about Jesus because Jesus' name is becoming well known. They proclaimed in their message, Jesus. Same message as, as us, right? A little bit different, but same message. We proclaim Jesus, Paul would say. And, and that's beginning to work, and that's going to lead me to my first point, which is that when we proclaim Jesus, we should expect some to fear. We should expect some people to be afraid. See, the disciples are doing what they're called to do, going into different villages and teaching about Jesus and casting out spirits, and people are beginning to wonder, who is this Jesus? Now, we've, as we've gone through the Gospel of Mark, we have encountered different viewpoints about who Jesus is. You might remember the impure spirits say he's the Son of God. Jesus says about himself, he's the Son of Man, the Bridegroom, the Lord of the Sabbath. He, he, the, the religious leaders say that it's by the power of Beelzebub that he drives out demons. Like, there's been different ideas of who Jesus is. In his own town, they said, isn't this just a carpenter? Because surely a carpenter couldn't teach the way that Jesus taught. See, everybody's beginning to discuss, what do you think about Jesus? As as the message goes out, people begin to wonder, what do you think about Jesus? And I would would say to you that what we believe about Jesus is, is going to directly impact our life in some way, don't you think? Right? I mean, if, you're, if you deny him and say it's by the power of Beelzebub, he, he casts out demons, you're going to reject him. If you believe that he's just a carpenter, you're going to say he's, he's, he, he can't be saying these things. If you believe he's the son of God, you might submit. If you believe that he's the son of man and you understand Daniel's vision, you would submit. See, what people believe about Jesus matters because it impacts their life. And as that message goes out, that impact might begin to draw up a little bit of fear inside of people. Right? They, they say things like this in, in chapter 6. Jesus' name had been well known, verse 14. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Now, that would make good sense, right? I mean, Jesus and John, the same age, they have the same ministry, similar, right? They're both pe- preaching repentance and kingdom. And uh, we find out now that John has been put to death. And so maybe, maybe Herod's starting to worry about this. It's like whack-a-mole a little bit. Like, I just, got, I just got rid of John and he's risen back up, right? So that there, there's a sense that maybe it's John. Maybe that's who Jesus is. The others say, well, he must be Elijah. And, and you can understand why the people of Israel might think he's Elijah. Every Passover, they set their table and there's a spot on that table where they're reminded that Elijah is their hope and that they're like, He's, he's going to usher in the Messiah. And they're, they're waiting there at that Passover table for Elijah to come. And remember what Elijah did? He worked miracles. He did fantastic things. He raised a child from the dead. What did Jesus do in chapter 5? He did the same thing. Doesn't it make sense that people might be saying, well, maybe he's John the Baptist, or maybe he's Elijah. After all, he's doing the same things that Elijah did. Maybe he's Elijah. And still others 
said about him that it's, it's a, a prophet, like one of the prophets long ago. There's so many different views of who Jesus is. And believing that he's any of those things is not really enough. I mean, of course, Jesus says about himself that he's a prophet. A prophet is not welcomed in his own town. So he claims about himself that he's a prophet. But he is far more than a prophet, isn't he? He's more than Elijah. He's the one who Elijah will prepare the way for. Jesus, as Mark says in the beginning of his gospel, is the Messiah, the Son of God. That's who Jesus is. But you can begin to see maybe why they're, they're worried about who Jesus is. Because the answer to that question impacts your life. Well, for, John, for uh, Herod, he, uh, he thought it might be John the Baptist. That's why in verse 16 it says, When Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. Do you see why he's afraid? He's afraid because of the way that he's lived his life. John was a good man, and Herod had him put to death. That's often why people respond with fear when they hear the gospel, is because of the way that they've lived their life prior, or the way they want to continue to live their life now. And when somebody comes along with this new message, the kingdom of God is near, repent, reorient your life to that kingdom, and believe that message, that's a commitment that should be a f scary. I, I believe it. I, th I think it should stir up fear in us as well because it's not a small commitment. It's one that we have to dedicate our life to. Right? Like, Jesus is not half in, half out kind of Messiah. He says, anybody who wants to come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's a scary commitment. So recognizing who Jesus is will have some impact on our life. And so as we go out and preach this message, we should expect that some will respond in fear. But we should also expect some people to try to stop the message. As it goes out, people are going to try to stop the message. And that's exactly what happens with, uh, with John the Baptist. If you look, we get a little family background. Anybody watch Jerry Springer? You can admit to it. I won't judge you from up here, right? You can admit to it. If you ever watched Jerry Springer, just raise your hand, right? You have. You know what family drama is like, and they start throwing chairs at each other, and, and uh, you, you always knew, right? Like if, if Jerry Springer started moving towards the back of the room, that that's when, that's when the, the, the fights were going to start, right? Like it was going to happen. But it was all messy family drama. John is put to death because of messy family drama. Look at what happens. In, in verse 17, it says, For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married, for John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to. See, that's the messy family drama. Now, I, I would, this week I've been trying to keep track of Herod's. Keeping track of Herod's are really difficult in the New Testament. You have Herod the Great, right? He dies in 4 AD. And uh, he's got 10 wives, right? That's, that, that's Jerry Springer right there. 10 wives is what, is what Herod has. And it's hard to keep track of all the wives because some of them have the same names. Imagine that house right? Like you're, you're talking to, to one of your wives and they think that you're talking to the, the other one and messy, messy family, right? But you have Herod the Great and Herod has 10 wives and each of his wives have different children. And just to make it more complicated, they sometimes name their children the same thing, right? So you got wives with the same name and then you got a bunch of children running around with the same names. Herod would have, would have been a, like, he's a difficult guy to kind of pin down in the New Testament. But this Herod that we're talking about is not Herod the Great. Herod the Great dies in 4 AD. If this Herod is Herod Antipas, and he is one of the children of Herod the Great, because after Herod dies, his kingdom is split into four different regions. And Herod Antipas is a patriarch over one of the regions, the regions of Galilee, right? It's his area that he's, he's submissive to Rome but it's his area, right? Well, Herod liked his brother Philip's wife. 
That's another episode of Jerry Springer, right? Because when, when he, Philip is not quite as powerful as Herod Antipas, and so Herodias, Philip's wife, decides that she would probably rather be with Herod Antipas. Maybe because he's just more foxy lad, I guess. Or maybe it's because of his status. He's higher up. He's a higher governing official. And, and Herodias seems to be somebody who likes to, to maneuver her way around a little bit. And so Herod Antipas takes his brother Philip's wife as his own. Jerry Springer, right? Like it's a messy family. And uh, John the Baptist calls him out and says, it's not lawful for you to marry your brother's wife. Now, he wasn't just making this up on his own. Leviticus tells us the same thing. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 16 says, do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. It's almost one of those rules that's in the Old Testament that you don't even know why it has to be there. It should be obvious, right? Like just, you can't have your brother's wife, but apparently it was a problem. And so Moses and God had to put it out, right? This is not something that should be happening. And so John the Baptist refuses to, to let immoral bad behavior continue. And so he calls it out. And when he calls it out, he's arrested and Herodias nurses a grudge. See, that's, as we take our message out, some people will be offended by it. And, and they will try to ex extinguish it. They will try, we should expect that some will try to stop the message. Don't say that I can't do, th do this or do that. And by the way, this is a big deal because there's wars that are started over this, this little arrangement, like battles that are, that are happening. And uh, you have to read Josephus to read about those, those battles, but it's a big deal caused major problems, and John refuses to let immoral behavior go unchecked amongst his leaders. And when, that, when you go out and you stop try to call people out, especially your leadership, people will try to extinguish that message, won't they? They'll try to, to, to stop it. And did you see that because, Herod, because John tells Herod it's not lawful, Herodias, Philip's ex-wife, now Herod's wife, nurses a grudge. I, as, I, as I thought about that statement, it's just such a great statement, nurses a grudge. Nurses are supposed to take care of things, keep things alive, right? You ever nurse a grudge to keep it going? Like, we, we do this all the time. People we might be angry with or people that uh, like have wronged us for some reason. We could forgive, we could let it go, we could move on, but we nurse it. We just continue to nurture that grudge, letting it fester and grow and become bigger and bigger. And before you know it, that grudge has turned into hatred. And hatred for Herodias meant that she wanted John the Baptist dead. Because as long as John still has the ear of Herod, he's a problem. And John does. If you look at verse, uh, if you look at if you look at uh, verse 17, verse 18, it says, For John had been saying to Herod, It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Like so many in our society, right? Like a lot of the crowds that have been following John through, throughout the, the Gospel of Mark, they're puzzled, they're amazed, they're perplexed. They, they want to know more about Jesus, but it's not quite enough to accept him, right? And that's Herod. He, he goes and he talks to John. He's amazed. He understands John is righteous and he's perplexed or puzzled about him, but that's not quite enough. See, when we take our message out like John the Baptist does, like Jesus, as he goes into Galilee and he says, Take the, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe. Like those disciples who Jesus sends out just earlier in this chapter when he says, go and preach, and they told people that they should repent. As we go out and take that message into the world, we speak the truth in love, but not everybody will, will appreciate that message, and some will try to stop that message. We should expect it. That's how they've treated prophets since prophets came onto the scene. 
They've tried to stop them. So this is what happens. Finally, the opportunity comes. And when that happens, well, we should expect some to try to destroy the message. That's my third point. So we should expect some to uh, try to stop the message. We should expect some to, to fear the message. And we should expect some to try to destroy the message. And you got to look for that opportune time. In uh, verse 21, it says, Finally, the opportunity came. On his birthday, Herod gave a great banquet for his high officials and his military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came and danced, she pleased Herod and the dinner guests. Let's just stop right there for a second. Do you recognize what's going on? This is a party. It's a banquet and he's got all his get dinner guests there. People from his, his leading officials, his military commanders, they're all there. And now the daughter of Herodias comes out and does a little dance for him. Let's just to make sure we see how dysfunctional this family is. This is his stepdaughter, but also his niece, right? It's, it's, not, it's not the kind of thing that kings should be doing. Well, it's not, it's not a moral thing. It's the kind of thing that John would have called him out for. And she comes and she dances. His stepdaughter, his niece, dances for him. And he's greatly pleased. And that's the opportunity that Herodias has been, been looking for because the king says to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her on oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. You might hear uh, Esther in that, right? The king promised Esther, you know, up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered because she nursed a grudge. She continued to nurse that grudge until the opportune time came and she could, she could do something about it. And when Herod threw a party and immoral, impure things happened at that party, it opened the door for John's death. And so in verse 26, it says, the king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath, and his dinner guest, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately set the executioners with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. What a banquet, right? What are you serving? The head of John the Baptist right there on a platter. But you should expect it. You should expect that some will try to destroy the message because the message is hard for some to hear. And, and as John goes out and preaches repentance, he has to tell people that the way they're living is wrong and they have to change. Some will fear that. Some will try to stop it. And some will outright try to destroy it. That's the, that's the message. But why does Mark put it here? Why did he put it right in the middle of the story of the disciples going out? And I think, I think the reason it's here is, is just as important. See, in the Old Testament, prophets who do what God has called them to do often meet unfortunate ends. John the Baptist doing what God has called him to do meets an unfortunate end. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus says about himself, a prophet is without honor except for his, his, in his hometown. He calls himself a prophet. And as we look at what happens to John, it begins to kind of see what might happen to Jesus. As another king who is too weak, and because of his oath, and because of uh, his reputation, will have Jesus put to death. And those disciples who are also sent out, who haven't come back, look at verse 30. The apostles, by the way, this is the first time in Mark that they're called apostles. That apostles means one who is sent, right? And Jesus sent these apostles out, gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. You know what kind of end these, most of these apostles are going to meet as well? Similar to John, similar to Jesus. 
See, I think the reason Mark stops right here is because Mark puts this story right here is because he's showing us the kind of things that we might encounter as we go out to preach that gospel message. We're going we're gonna to have to learn to trust God. That doesn't mean we can't take provisions with us. We should, right? We, we have to be willing to trust God. We have to expect that some will try to stop our message. Some will fear our message. Some will try to destroy the message. But does it work? See, the gospel is still growing the kingdom today. The message is still going out in spite of the many, many leaders that have had people put to death to put out this message. The church is still strong. But it's strong because the people in it aren't willing to say, I'm not going to go out. They're not willing to, to not take that message into their community. See, the call of Christ is to pick up our cross and follow him. He was a preacher who said the kingdom of God is coming. Repent and believe. He commissioned us, go into the world and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Those disciples went out from Jerusalem to Judea to the ends of the earth. They went out preaching that same message. And today we preach that same message and we'll encounter the same trials. The message will go out. It will continue. The question is, are you brave enough to be like John? Are you brave enough to be like those disciples? See, that's how the church grows. It doesn't grow if we keep the message here. We have to go and take that message out. It is not without risk, but it's worth it. We're going to sing a song of invitation. It's number 915 in your hymnal. Let's trust and obey.